Good morning, everyone. I'm Taryn Saunders, Thought Leadership Manager at Trialog, and thank you for joining us this morning. So Trialog hosts these webinars usually on the last Thursday of the month, not only on Leap Year Day. And today we'll be discussing the trends driving the evolution of corporate social investment and how companies can leverage these emerging shifts to drive greater systemic social change. A few technical points before we start. There are two ways to engage. So you can use the chat function to connect with fellow delegates and to share your thoughts. And then you can ask questions in the Q&A box. We'll ask these to the panelists later in the session. So please direct your question to the relevant panelists and then keep your questions short and clear. And those are in the chat, the chat box. And then a short survey will pop up on your screen at the end of the session, and it will also be shared with you via email. And please do share your thoughts here so that we can keep improving these sessions for you. Then to note that the session is being recorded and the notes and the recording will be available to everyone on the Trialog Knowledge Hub. Moving on to our agenda. So after a quick introduction, I'll be handing over to our expert panelists for their opening comments, and we'll then dive into discussion and they'll answer some of your questions from the Q&A box. Each panelist will then give a short closing comment. The first poll will appear on your screen now, and we'd like to know which type of organization you represent. And while that poll is up, I'd like to briefly share what Trilog does. So Trilog is one of a few consultancies that focus exclusively on responsible business. And we do this through our consulting and advisory services, as well as through our knowledge sharing platforms. With the latter, Trilog convenes the annual Business in Society Conference, which will be held at the Focus Rooms in Johannesburg on the 14th and 15th of May this year. So please do join us. The registrations will be opening soon. And we also publish the annual Business in Society Handbook, which now also has an interactive online version on the Trilog Knowledge Hub. The Trilog Knowledge Hub is an online library of research, reporting, case studies, and information on responsible business and development. And the write-up and recording of these webinars are available on the Trilog Knowledge Hub. Then the Trilog Academy is an online learning platform offering courses for both nonprofits and companies. And if you'd like to partner with us on any of these platforms, please do reach out to the marvelous Lerato Ramoba on lerato at trialog.co.za. Let's see the results of the poll. So as we can see with us today, we've got a nice mix, mostly nonprofit organizations followed by big business. Thank you for joining us. Right, let's move on to the introduction. So if we can move to the next slide for a second, there we go. Corporate social investment, as you know, as, has a rich history in South Africa, and it still plays a vital role in our country's development and in addressing historic injustices. CSI has evolved over decades from the early days of charitable giving to new approaches that consider how to achieve a more systemic and holistic impact. And the diagram you can see here shows the trajectory from charitable CSI or CSI 1.0, an essentially welfareist approach, to CSI 3.0, a more holistic approach that foregrounds collaboration, cross-sector engagement, and wide knowledge sharing and advocacy, among other characteristics. And these are not milestones to be achieved. They each have a role to play in development and parts of each approach can be used in one company's strategy as there will always be a need for each. CSI 2.0 or what we call strategic CSI is still the dominant approach. And it remains useful for companies to have CSI initiatives that offer high value for both business and development. 
But to deliver a more holistic and systemic impact, it may be necessary to incorporate some elements of CSI 3.0. The approach is more complex, and Trialog has identified three major trends that are driving the shift and are likely to influence CSI in the near future. Nick Rocky will expand on these more later, but in short, let's introduce them one by one. So the first is increasing integration within a company. With CSI embedded more holistically across the business, and the second is working towards a systemic impact in society with companies taken more seriously as the voice of social issues and more collaboration, such as collective impact models. And the third trend is enhanced ways of working. And that includes new ways of leverage, leveraging finance and a rebalance of power with more voice and decision making given to those on the ground. Before we move on, we're just going to show you the first slide again, which shows CSI 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0. And we'd love to know your opinion in another poll. So in the next poll, We'd love you to select what you think are the top three features that you think should be integrated into CSI strategies going forward. A tough question, so we're gonna leave that up for a few seconds. So that's what do you think are the top three features that should be integrated into CSI strategies going forward? A few more seconds there as you select those. Thank you. Let's look at the results. So many people have selected CSI becoming more core to the business. That's one of our top at 57% collective impact initiatives at 57 as well. And then CSI built into the brand proposition at 32%. Greater company investment in CSI at 37. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts there. So why does this matter? And what are the recommendations for companies who are considering a more integrated approach that takes a more systemic impact in society? Let's turn to our experts to find out. So for now, their cameras and mics are off, and I'll ask them to turn on their cameras one by one as they share. They are Nick Rocky, Managing Director of Trialog, Priya Naik, CEO and founder of Samhita Social Ventures, joining us from India today, and Noma Machila, Lead Specialist of Group CEI for CSI for Liberty. So we'll start with Nick. Nick, if you could turn on your camera and mic. Nick, could you tell us some more about CSI 3.0 or leverage CSI and why you think this is the future? What do these trends say about the state of CSI and why do you think it's so important for companies to be aware of them? Thanks, Taryn. Um... Yeah, I think the concept of leverage is important. You know, I mean, CSI accounts for uh, the total spend in South Africa of about 12 billion. Uh, we estimated that at 11.8 billion last year. But it's that, that amount is relatively small um, compared to the overall government and, and, and total collective development spend. So to make an impact, that 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 amount of money needs to be leveraged. Um, and one of the key roles that companies can play is to discover practices that work and to get those practices more uh, adopted more broadly. And I think there's a strong appetite for that. 
Um, so I, I, I certainly think it's going to be a part of the future. I don't think it's going to be the entire future. Um, it doesn't make sense in all instances, um, and it's 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 tough. CSI at three point naught in in terms of leveraging your spend, uh, and we'll talk about it today. Requires a, you know a lot more sort of complexity in the work that you do. So it's not for everyone, and certainly it's not for for organisations uh, where they've got you know relatively small budgets. Um, and I say relative, um, but if you're making a ten million rand profit, your one percent of net pat in that instance might be a hundred thousand rand. You can't overinvest in terms of discovery and processes in terms of spending that, and it probably doesn't make spend, sense. But if you're a ten billion rand profit company and you you you've got a hundred uh, million to spend. Then certainly, how do you leverage the work that you're doing um, to to, uh, to to achieve a broader aim? I think that's an important consideration, and we've seen companies certainly starting to to test those uh, to test those at that space and to 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 consider how they can do more with their funding. We've seen this progression, as I think you you've spoken about, um, from one to two to three. Um, and and you know we've been in the space a long time, so we 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 see in the early days a lot of grant making going on, uh, you know, uh, reactive, you know, call for proposals, find good proposals, spending the money, uh, allocating grants based on certain criteria, and that still exists, and there's still a place for that. And then the the sort of need for companies to 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 really um, understand, you know, what's working, what's not working, put an M and E frameworks around their projects. Um, and to to really track those projects and how they develop over time. And that's the sort of level two that we're seeing. And now we're seeing this, uh, you know, how do we leverage what we're doing and and, and achieve greater impact? You know, a lot of people would come to me and say, well, you know, where's the 10 billion or the 12 billion going? You know, we're not seeing the impact. And I think there was some frustration in that. Um, and 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 organizations now wanting to to actually see the the, the bigger difference. Um so shifting from um, you know this into this more uh, um, uh, strategic uh, approach, stronger um, uh, internal alignment, um, where you can leverage the resources of the business, and, uh, and 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 stronger need for sort of collaborative, collective impact type processes, uh, in spite of some of the challenges that people are pushing into those organisations are pushing into those uh, sort of spaces. Um, I think we'll talk more about it, but I think, you know, just fundamentally, it needs to be in a, in a more defined space. You know, you can't cut across many different development sectors. One needs to focus uh, in that there has to be multiple players, some sort of collective effort. Um, and importantly, you know, really trying to understand how one can can extend the impact out of beyond the influence of the direct contribution that companies are making. Through advocacy, research, uh, lobbying, etc., um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but that's yeah, just some initial thoughts on the on the on the topic. Thank you so much, Nick, and thank you for expanding on that. And yeah, we, as Nick mentioned, we'll touch on some of those points later on. Um, but for now, we'll we'll hear from Priya next. So Priya, if you could turn on your camera and your microphone. Could you tell us a little bit more about the CSR landscape and trends in India and whether you've ob observed any of the characteristics that Nick has spoken to of leverage CSI? Thanks, Darren. Uh, and thanks, Nick. It is such a pleasure to be here. And I can't believe there's 325 people. We never get those numbers in India. So delighted to be here and good morning to all of you. Um, I thought in my five minutes, I'll quickly cover three things. One is um, the trends in India as far as CSI is concerned. Um, I think just an increasing movement towards collaboratives uh, to see much more leveraged impact. And really the advantages that these collaboratives offer to the private sector in a way that you can leverage corporate philanthropy, uh, but do four things, right? One is address the needs of corporate stakeholders, create win-win solutions for the private sector, the public sector, financial markets, and the social sector, um, to really leverage philanthropic money in a very significant manner and really solve social um, issues at scale. Um, so in the last few years, we've seen CSI contribution grow up, I mean, go up kind of dramatically. So compared to 2016-17, we've now seen a 73% increase uh, in spending uh, by corporates. A lot of this happened because India, similar to South Africa, has 
a regulation which requires large companies to allocate a part of their funding uh, towards social causes. But what's been interesting also is that are the 20,000 companies that are mandated to do CSR, as we call it in India, uh, more than 50%. So 10,000 companies actually spend more than the 2% allocation, um, which really maybe points to the fact that companies are going above and beyond just the call from a governance perspective or a compliance perspective and really seeing the benefits of that contribution. Um, similar to South Africa, I think um, you know companies here are also being directed by national priorities. So even in just the last year, we've seen a 130% increase in um, CSR spending on agriculture and environment issues. That has primarily happened because of the climate change that um, the country and the rest of the world is experiencing, but also because an Indian regulator um, really encouraged companies to spend a lot more money uh, when it comes to green projects. So um, government nudging goes very far here, um, similar, I'm sure, to South Africa and other countries. Um, a really positive trend is uh, the government encouraging companies to invest a lot more in impact assessment um, and really guiding them to make more data-driven, evidence-based uh, decisions. Um, it's been such a good trend and, you know, it's something that companies seem to have embraced. Um, now, just moving to collaboratives and, you know, in the last few years, particularly after the pandemic, uh, India saw a huge jump in the number of philanthropic collaboratives. It grew by 3x. So uh, it went from 15 uh, collaboratives to 43. Um, these 43 collaboratives really leveraged about $250 million uh, from a set of funders. Uh, and these collaboratives were very interesting uh, for the philanthropic ecosystem because they're flexible, they're efficient, they address complex and cross-sectoral issues such as health and education and women's uh, empowerment. Uh, but I think the limitation was that only 30% of the top 40 companies uh, in India actually engaged with these philanthropic collaboratives. And I think part of what was holding companies back was that um, the collaboratives were structured primarily as being funded by global and Indian foundations, centrally run by nonprofits. And so given that there wasn't really a sustainability agenda uh, or a market making agenda is probably what gave companies a little bit of pause. Uh, but having said that, I think while that's the national trend, um, Samita in the last three years has been running a collaborative called Revive. Revive was set up to get 700,000 workers and entrepreneurs who were impacted by the pandemic back on their feet. And what was fascinating about the work um, that, that we did in partnership with about 35 different companies was the following. Uh, we knew that money was going to be very scarce. And so this is practically what happened. Uh, organizations like Google and Microsoft came in and supported the digital empowerment of millions of citizens that uh, needed to be digitally enabled given how quickly India and the rest of the world was moving to a digital first economy. Uh, banks and financial institutions came in and then built people's capability um, to actually drive much greater financial inclusion. Uh, companies such as Walmart came in and said, hey, we want to focus on agriculture and climate change. Uh, other companies came in and said, uh, you know, we will drive linkages to, let's say, markets and our government schemes. And so what was great is that a single individual ended up being supported by different organizations each of whom leveraged their core competence and got this nice impact multiplier, right? Without Google and Microsoft's work, the banks could not have built the financial inclusion work and Walmart couldn't have done a focus on agriculture and, uh, and climate and so on and so forth. So while we attempted to really stitch together a lot of these collaborative partnerships, the other big movement that's happened in India that, um, you know, I know that the Indian government is actively talking to South Africa and a whole bunch of other countries about is really the scale of digital public infrastructure. Um, so DPI, as it's called in India, basically has three components, right? It is a mechanism to ensure that every citizen has a unique identity. Second, it has a payment system. And third, it has a data exchange layer. 
And just to give you a sense of what that actually means from a large social impact and from a private sector collaboration perspective is the following. Companies now can partner with the government to unlock access to skilling at scale. Um, the millions of people who get skilled can now, through this data layer, uh, get seamlessly integrated into banks who can then give them access to working capital, assuming that let's say they're starting new businesses. The same set of people can now get access to government schemes, which is being leveraged across multiple government departments. The same people can then be connected to a wide variety of nonprofits and corporates and become part of their supply chain. Um, so what the Indian government in collaboration with the private sector, financial institutions, the philanthropic organizations and nonprofits are now doing is to say that um, specific smaller projects that typically would happen in tiny locations can now happen at scale just because of the digital infrastructure that uh, the government of India is building and the private sector is supporting at scale. So just to conclude, um, a lot of the trends that Taryn and uh, Nick talked about in terms of, you know, how do you really get companies to focus on core business? How do you get leverage alignment? Um, how do you really uh, get access to data and insights at scale is really being enabled because uh, of this data and technology layer, which does three things, right? A, it connects millions of citizens to all of these sectors at virtually no transaction costs. Second, because different products and services can be delivered to the individual through philanthropy or through business support, et cetera, we're now seeing very significant gains in income, digital inclusion, economic empowerment, et cetera. And then the third, uh, which we're very excited about, is we're now seeing philanthropic and CSR money actually creating a very significant leveraged impact. So I'll just give one example and pause. Uh, India, similar to South Africa, has millions of citizens who don't get access to credit. And so earlier this year, we partnered with the Indian government and um, a couple of corporates. And the, the sort of uh, program we structured was um, a little bit of money from a private sector organization could then unlock about 50x money from the government, which in turn could unlock 200 times the amount of financial capital that was going towards lending. Um, so we used an instrument called a credit guarantee, um, which was funded by CSR. Uh, but basically, the, the small credit guarantee has now unlocked very significant amounts of lending to new to credit borrowers who traditionally have been considered very high risk by banks, right? So really encouraging companies to find opportunities um, that are very low cost, that are in partnership with the government and the private sector and financial institutions can really help us achieve a lot of the objectives that Taryn talked about uh, on the very first slide. Um, I'll pause and would love to continue the conversation later on. Thank you so much, Priya. Thank you. It's it's great for us to be able to see and discuss some of the global comparisons as well. And thank you for sharing some examples of that as well. Is that the very good points that you brought up around how to de de using data, using technology, and bringing that using that with those collaborative efforts with with all kinds of stakeholders can really create a greater impact. And and we'll chat about more. We'll chat about that more later. So thank you so much. And next we'll hear from Noma. So Noma, we've spoken a little bit about how the future of CSI involves more collaboration. And the Liberty Community Trust invests in education initiatives and it partners with several organizations. Can you talk about one of these collaborations to give us an idea of how and, and what that means in practice, as well as some of the lessons that you've learned so far? Thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. I think by the way of introduction, not everyone knows what Liberty is. Um, so Liberty is a financial services group. Um, we've been in existence for over 60 years. So we operate in the risk and saving space, specifically in the life insurance asset management. Um, and we have our, our subsidiary, Stanley, which is our investment uh, subsidiary. We are a subsidiary of Standard Bank and we are now wholly owned uh, by the group. 
So I am part of the corporate citizenship space, which looks after the Liberty Community Trust, which is the foundation of the subsidiary, which is Liberty. So the aim of the trust really is to improve the learning outcomes of the young people in South Africa. And we do this by investing in education initiatives. Uh, hopefully, in a way, we are able to bring sustainable economic inclusion in, in the system of South Africa. So as a team, when we started, we look at the landscape of South Africa in, in literacy and numeracy, what SA's response is in education and the factors that really influence South African learners in achieving their learning outcomes. I mean, we concluded on three strategic focus area. Actually, uh, the one I'm giving example of is in the foundation phase literacy. So when we're looking at projects, uh, we partnered with the likes of, of, of Trilog, that's where also collaboration came in to help us source a strategic uh, partner. So three well-experienced NGOs, uh, the likes of Pukdesh, Nalibal, and Wordworks applied independently as they operate in the literacy space. So when we presented these to the board and the board challenged us to say, can we go back to them and ask that they must bring one individual joint proposal. So what was interesting really about this is that um, all of these have a common, had a common goal um, of solving literacy crisis in South Africa, but some were not providing a holistic approach to what we wanted to see. So we need, to, we need an organization and partners that will help us shift the needle in the literacy crisis and not do what, what others already are doing. Um, and I mean, we've seen that research suggests that we need to look beyond traditional focus of classroom and look where the children's um, needs are at first. So we had an, we had extensive discussions, which led to the three, three partners really willing to have a joint proposal. Um, also, I think what helped was that one or two have worked together in a various form, but they have not collaborated in the manner in which we, we asked. So what was key really is to define the rules and responsibility and signing that memorandum of understanding. I mean, having a steer core was one that helped to oversee the strategic direction and the implementation and including all stakeholders, whether we like it or not, um, but make sure that we involve these key decision makers. And sub there are subcommittees we had, working groups um, with the implementing team, local stakeholders we had, because it's, it's the program is, is it's being implemented in the Eastern Cape, ITEC and Kululeka, were part of those local stakeholders. We then needed to formulate what, what is our me media and PR team, monitoring and evaluation, like the project leads, who's going to be documenting everything. I mean, we met as most frequently, like the steer core met um, monthly, and also depending where the stage of the program is, uh, we had each representative and, and those that were implementing, they would meet, meet, very, meet very often, perhaps weekly. So, but I mean, one, one of the things that is very important was that making time and being intentional, committing, all of us, we said, we're not missing the meeting unless it's absolutely necessary. If I'm not there, I have a team, um, can that representative come in, in case that I'm not, I'm not there? So there was a lot of deliberate intention. Um, the challenge hit us because this project started in COVID at the beginning of the program, um, the ever-changing personnel from various organizations during the course of the program, whether it's maternity, resignation, accident, and parting ways with others. Um, key was also as a funder, um, site visits are important uh, so that you can have you can get the pulse of the program, uh, speaking to the stakeholders on the ground to hear what how are they experiencing the program. I mean, one of the aha moments that I've had, and I've been in the space for just a bit, um, programs are good on paper, but in reality, they're always different. Um, so this, for me, helped me to be able to articulate and engage better with the trustees and being realistic, really, what is doable amidst the limited resources that we have. I mean, one of the toughest jobs is to really appeal to the board members uh, to make sure that um, they see beyond the rent and sense that they've allocated to the investment. And one of the challenges was really also the pressure of... Um, showcasing impact, a systematic change, which we claimed we're going to have. And, and I think as an industry, there are certain terminologies that we're using, which doesn't assist us much. And sometimes we use them interchangeably, although they mean things that are different, like your outputs and outcomes and impact. Everyone wants to see the impact, but realistically speaking, if you're gonna find a project for a year or three years, that systematic change, you really have to prove. Um, and especially we operate in dependencies. So I think overall, um, uh, it is a lot of work. So communication, 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 and you can never do enough of that. So the trust, transparency is key because there's a lot of dependencies. There must be trust that each will deliver. 
And I mean, at the end of the day, there's an implication that there's a lot of millions that have been invested and everyone is looking at us to, 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 to account. Um, but I can't emphasize more, willing parties and commitment is key. I mean, to what Nick was saying, if I were to just add on, um, definitely leveraging with the business. CSI has moved from that 2.0 to that 3.0, leveraging and with the business area and making sure that we reach the bigger impact. Um, and also the complexities in which we operate in. We operate in a competitive space. Um, brand, we're a brand, we want to be seen, we want to exist that we're doing something. So we're fighting for a market share. So I do think there's more difficulties in this space. Um, even if, and, the, and also there's a need, there's a, there's a dying need in society of the work that we are doing. So I think we must also remember that we operate in a system that already exists and has its own independencies. So when I hear a lot of people saying, where's this 12 point billion going? I mean, the impact is there, but you might not necessarily see it in the bigger picture. Um, so having things like your monitoring and evaluation is key to drive that systematic change. And I think Nick mentioned in terms of being focused, because we have really have limited funding. And we've seen over the years that the, the funds are dwindling. And and yeah, and there's a move in terms of looking beyond grant funding. I'll 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 stop here and and I'll I'll add more as we go on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Norma. It's really helpful for us to see some of these principles in action and, and also to hear some of the key success factors that you have experienced and some of the challenges you've experienced as well. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I'd now like to invite all our panelists to turn on their cameras as we discuss a few more points and, and also some questions from the audience. So firstly, and, and this one, I think um, I'll ask Nick first, and, and I think Norma and Priya, you can you could add to this as well, is a question from Bobo, um, which is on the issue of corporate collaboration, which of course has its challenges as, as all three of you mentioned. And it's a question about, about how can corporate structure the collaboration without that being seen as anti-competitive behavior from a legislative from a legislation point of view so so how can corporates collaborate better together we know there are some challenges there is there any advice that you've seen nick perhaps there are some examples that you that you want to share as well um sorry should i go first then that would be great thank you yeah i mean i i i think um that um, I mean, if we just look at some of the considerations that that that's required um, to 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 move up to a sort of uh, a more complex uh, three point zero level, um, and I think Norma referred to some of those. You know, uh, the um, the board and the decision makers and the uh, the investment mandate and the resistance to change is is, is real. Um, and people are used to the way that the business is usual, which is sort of you know, doing, um, uh, you know, investing in, in, in initiatives where you can see the change. Um, so the, the strategy and the, the integration of the business and the buy-in at a senior level is absolutely critical uh, to, to affect that sort of change, to get people to using to doing different things. It, it means you need a different uh, a structure, different capacity, different roles. Um, so, um, you know, in terms of examples, uh, I mean, an organization, we're doing some work with, you know, someone is now accountable for the applied learning, uh, you know, information uh, directive. That's someone's day job. They get up and they think, how do we leverage the learning out of our program? It's a key part of the, the, the embedded strategy. So it's an example of how you need to actually rethink the process in order to actually uh, start delivering uh, different outcomes. Um, and they're, they're very uh, specific challenges, you know, in terms of uh, the collaborative approach it takes time to, to to get collaboration right. Um, it's a longer, it's 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 the, the time dimensions are for, for some sort of uh, impact. Norma spoke about, um, you know, how do you measure success? It's not as easy attributable back to the company as you as you, you do when you've got a sort of programmatic type approach. Uh, the brand recognition, which is often a very important thing for a company. Um, sometimes gets lost in the the or it's not as easy to attribute the process to the company 
um, as well. So these are some of the challenges and, and um, uh, you know, examples where organizations are starting to contribute into that space, almost test the, the, the water, providing some funding in which is not project specific. Um, so we're seeing some corporates now starting to do that. Uh, we're seeing some of the nonprofits in the space that are really thinking out the box. Uh, DG Murray, for example, you know, looking at at, at certain very innovative type pro processes, um, Standard Bank to Tour, ABSA, uh, really investing in these sort of spaces as well. Liberty, uh, in terms of the collaboration type approach, um, you know, it, just I, I'll, I'll stop talking. But the, the 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 incentive to work together is not easy. You know, NPOs don't typically want to work together, and companies typically don't want to work together. Companies, in order to protect their brand. NPOs in, to, in, in order to sort of preserve their space and their IP and their, um, you know, so so sharing is doesn't come naturally. Um, and what Liberty's done in their instance is they've they've kind of pulled people into a space together so that sharing took place with a single outcome that was required. And I think that that's that's quite powerful. It's a good example of, of how it can work. Thank you, Nick. And Norma. Could we hear from you a little bit more about that? So perhaps if you could share a bit more about how these partnerships and collaborations with the NPOs that you've mentioned, perhaps with corporates, how they have been important to realizing Liberty's CSI strategy. I think it's it's very difficult. I mean, we have to we have to say. Um, in fact, I I don't like the word collaboration. I mean, I was referring to the team. That is the most difficult thing to do. But I but I think. Um, if we're genuine enough and there's an intention to improve, and I think not not forgetting the why we're here, I mean we are here to better the society. And if you're doing it alone, we're not going to we're not going to work. So I think coming to that understanding and really being able to define. I mean, if you look at the three NGOs that I I, I refer to, they are they're strong in the literacy space, um, but then there's one that's better in the other. So I think maybe because I was a funder and I was able to analyze to say, this is my sense that you do this, one does this, and the other one does this, and the other one does that, although you're operating in the literacy space, but what is distinct about each of you? Can we pull those things together? And are really having a real discussions and having those tier core meetings. I mean, you really see from the beginning of the meetings whether is this going to go anywhere or not? Um, and I think it's wearing that, um, that cap of maturity and, and then saying that we can do this together. We're not in the space to compete, but we're in this space to, to scale up and, and really showcase that it's doable. And I think for me, as much as I've, we've been working with other NGOs, it's, it's possible also to work with other, with other um, corporates. But then there's that, that complexity that I mentioned that we don't operate in a system that's in isolation. There's that brand presence that is expected and we are competitors in business. <laughs> And, and and it's convincing. So I guess having the right people to make those decisions, because when we go back internally with all our hopes and, and great work, you are asked, um, this competitor is there. Why are you partnering with them? So I guess it's being able to articulate that clearly and, and, and showcase the impact that you'll be doing. But it's not easy, I have to say. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Norma, and thank you for sharing that. I think it's it's also it's really good to get an idea of some of the challenges as well and some of the barriers that that companies are facing as well. And um, Priya, you gave us some good examples of of collaboration across governments, across big businesses, across NGOs as well. Um, and I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that as well, just in terms of the competitive aspect and and whether that comes into the challenges that you've seen. In, in the space in India as well. Yeah, so Charan, there are two kinds of companies, right? Companies that come from different sectors and it's much easier for them to collaborate because like I said, the example that I gave when Google came in, built out the digital capability of citizens, it was then much easier for other companies to come in and add on a set of non-competing but very synergistic set of interventions, right? It, it helped the banks then transact with these individuals or it helped other people provide more skilling information. Uh, and there we actually did not see much of a challenge because, um, and this goes back to some of the challenges that Nick kind of outlined, right? One, we were very clear that while the overall impact measurement was increase in income, 
that increase in income itself was being attributed to multiple um, inputs. So uh, Google's contribution in terms of digital empowerment was measured through the lens of saying, well, is somebody digitally empowered right now? Or a bank's uh, inputs were measured from the basis of financial inclusion, while all of the funders still got the overall attribution of increase in income. So the fact that we were able to tease out uh, inputs, outputs, and outcomes systematically for each funder and for every implementation partner meant that the measurement was much clearer. And I agree with what Norma and uh, Nick said, that unless everyone benefits, the collaboration doesn't work, which means everyone should get better capacity support, more funding, more efficiency, um, you know, more visibility, greater impact. And so the, so the two secrets of collaboration are, A, you need to customize it for every person, right? Because people are not gonna, while they may sign off on the why, they're not each going to sign off on the how because the how looks different for each of them. And second, unless everyone wins systematically that the world is better through collaboration, you're not going to see the collaboration continue. I mean, the reason you've seen the growth in collaboratives in India is because every collaborative has demonstrated um, through quantitative mechanics, why the collaboration is better. Um, and then just the, now when you change the industry and when you say, hey, let's get a bunch of banks to collaborate or we can get a bunch of healthcare companies to collaborate, then one has to be very careful. So I'll give you one example. Uh, when we were trying to solve the problem of saying, how can banks as a whole end up supporting new to credit borrowers? A key question that came up is we don't know how to evaluate borrowers. So imagine a street vendor who only transacts based on cash and has no digital footprint, no banking history, how is a bank supposed to evaluate their business? And it's not a problem for like that, uh, you know, one bank encounters, every bank in the country encounters that problem, right? And so increasingly we're saying, let's use corporate social investments to create public goods that benefit the ecosystem as a whole. So we're now creating a pre-credit score, I won't get into the details, but it's a mechanism for banks to lend to an underserved segment, and we're now seeing multiple banks coming in uh, and really putting in their contribution. So I think just want to summarize that there are some problems that are best addressed through non-competing private sector actors collaborating in a way that each one wins. And then there are a set of problems that where you, you need um, people in the same industry to collaborate because then you're improving the ecosystem for everybody else. So different strategies. And then um, I do want to just spend one minute on, um, you know, NPOs collaborating. I saw a bunch of questions saying everyone's collaborating for a limited set of money, right? And so very simply, because we, across all of our collaboratives, we have anywhere between 75 to 100 NGO partners. And the simple way of doing this is two ways, right? One, we work with each one of them to understand their three to five year strategy. So we're interested not just in this program or this moment or this funding stream, we're actually interested in what happens to the organization on a three-year period. And second, we're very clear about the unit economics and the commercials of every organization that's involved. Unless everyone makes money, the collaboration does not work, right? And roles and responsibilities have to be very clear. And while we thought that this would be an incredibly difficult exercise, it's actually been surprisingly easy, where we've seen a win-win-win our beneficiaries become customers over a period of time. Our NGOs have more capability and better depth. Our companies are seeing a much more um, leverage. So every dollar is now unlocking 10, 15, 20 dollars of other people's money. And so we've really seen this collaboration play out in ways that no one's uncomfortable anymore. Thank you, Priya. And thank you for sharing those examples again. I mean, those are all such good examples of, of multi-stakeholder collaboration. And thank you for bringing in more about your NPO partners as well and, and those that you've seen. Um, Norma has also shared about how Liberty has selected the NPO partners that they've worked with. Um, and I'd like to hear from Nick a little bit on that point as well, thinking a little bit more about CSI in the future. How do you think the role of nonprofit organizations in CSI will change in the future? And, and also whether you have any recommendations for nonprofit leaders. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is also around long-term versus short-term impact and, and, and how 
one can convince companies to be with those projects for the long haul um, and, and less, yeah, and, and take less continued funding on M&E results. So recommendations that you have for nonprofit leaders, how can they align more in the way that CSI is moving towards the future? Thanks, Taryn. Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, um, you know, getting the getting the basics right. And I, you know, I'm not in a nonprofit space, um, but I, um, we obviously look in on the nonprofits a lot. So, um, you know, I think practically, some some of these things are more difficult than than theoretically. But but certainly, you know, getting the financials right, getting M and E processes bedded into the organisations, companies need some sort of security. Um, uh, you know, they've got a count to their governance structures and it's just easier if those systems are in place um, and, 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 and you know, that the hygiene factors, you know, the BE scores, et cetera, are all sort of covered. I think that's 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 the, the, the sort of the hygiene sort of base level. But outside of that, I think understanding the developmental ecofield, these collaborations happen within a developmental space. So who are the key players? Who are the knowledge partners in that space? How do you engage with them? And I know all of these things take time, but how do you reach out? How do you become, you know, more than the isolated project or organization that you are? Um, you know, if you're in a particular geography and, and there are others doing similar work in, a, in different geographies, can you set up a conversation? Can you start sharing practices? Can you start collaborating and giving away some of your, your IP, for example, um, uh, to, to the benefit of, of really, uh, you know, building the resilience and the uh, capacity and the capability of your organizations. And I, I, I won't labor this, but I think one of the, um, yeah, I think there's always comfort for companies if they if they can see that you're connected and that you're collaborating and you're working with others. Um, the other is um, to um, to to encourage your your, um, your your corporates to go with you on that journey. Um, so that you become real partners, not just, uh, you know, this sort of, uh, we often when we talk to, to to companies about their role, you know, are you, we say, are you playing just a funding role? Or are you doing more than that? Or are you actually working with your, with, with the NPOs to understand the developmental space, to look for solutions together? And, and to encourage corporates to invest, not just in, you know, providing a check to deliver a solution, uh, in a linear and, and very confined way, but to to start, um, uh, you know, investing and, in, uh, you know, maybe proposing some research that could be done, proposing some funding for uh, doing some networking or bringing people together, et cetera. So, um, you know, try to push your corporate funders into a slightly more advanced space. It's obviously difficult depending on the scale of the NPO as to what you you, you, you typically can achieve, but there's some very strong, powerful, really rich, or NGOs with really rich information and insights, how can they leverage that to help their partners go along the journey with them, I think. That's what we're saying. Thank you, Nick. That's some really sound advice for, for our NPO leaders. And I mean, just to, to uh, summarize some of that, showing evidence of collaboration, showing uh, that focus on partnership, the focus on impact, uh, taking a more proactive approach and, and focusing more on how you can add value to to the corporates that you want to work with. Um, those are, are some of the are some of the, the the issues that I've come up across across the speakers. So thank you for sharing that. And Norma, is there anything you want to add to that before we move on to the next question? I think I think um I think being focused is key as well. Um Knowing, I mean, one of the roles that I play, although I'm a funder, when I'm unable to find you, I act in a, as an advisory role um, to say, but potentially you should tweak in order for you to get funding. And also, you know, it's tiring to always apply for funding and then you get no, right? And then it, it gets discouraging. So for you to limit those no, apply to companies that are similar to what you're doing. So we must then look at the strategy. I often find, for example, if I give you an example, is that people will always ask um, for sports funding. But if, if they look at Liberty, we're not in that space. So, and also being part of um, of the likes of Trilog, being part of that database, being part of these webinars, and, and just taking time to learn what is what are these tricks. And sometimes I know money is not there, um, but I'll certain functions 
to say, even, even if in a once off, um, to say, can you help me write this proposal? Um, and, and I think I, can, I cannot um, emphasize more. The external evaluation is key. So I know NGOs usually don't have money for external evaluation, but when you're asking for funding, embed that in the funding and say, we don't have enough money. Could you help us? Uh, because companies always want to see what is the impact. And remember I said earlier on, I mean, we always use these words interchangeably, output, outcome, and impact, and impact is long-term. Um, and I think that is quite key. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing that, Noma, and, and really for highlighting again how important that alignment with the company goals are and with the company's CSI strategy are and how important it is to prove that impact when, when you are talking to a company. So thank you for that. Um, we I mean, are can we add one point. Of course. Yeah. So you know, we we work with a large number of NPOs, right? And the one thing I always tell them is that what is your flagship should become the company's flagship. It should no longer be you going every year to pitch your work in education or healthcare or social justice. The day the company believes that this is their program, your funding issues are over because now it is up to them to get internal alignment and really champion the program as their own. And we've now seen this, right? Yes, you have to do the hard work that Nick and Noma talked about, about demonstrating progress and, about, and showing um, the results. But as soon as you change the conversation from you are funding me to I am helping you as a company achieve your social impact or environmental goals, then, you know, the nature of engagement changes dramatically. Um, so today we find that our funders are championing us because they think they're championing their work, right? We just happen to be delivering the work that they believe is important. So I think changing that that narrative um, goes a really long way in ensuring sustained and long-term funding. Thank you so much, Priya. And thanks for bringing to light that importance again of changing the conversation and shifting the power dynamic. And I really like that, that line that you said that your flagship should become the company's flagship as well. So I just want to move on briefly. We focused a lot on collaboration, but I just want to touch on one of the other aspects of CSI 3.0 for now, um, which is knowledge sharing and advocacy. So that's one of the trends that's been identified. It's one of the things that we've we've noticed is, is becoming part of the future of CSI. Um, Nick, if you could share a little bit about the business case for this and, and why is it so important for companies to invest in wider knowledge sharing and advocacy? No, sure. Um, I'll be brief on this. I think one of the, the key things that companies can do um, is to establish what works um, and to leverage that. As I mentioned that at the start. So and the innovation role that companies can play, um, you know, government can't afford to do that. It's a very slowly, slow moving machine. Um, it takes years for policy to be embedded. It takes it takes a long time to 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 shift that. Uh, you know, it's a big tanker that's moving in a direction. It takes a while to change direction. Companies can move very on a, on a much more agile basis. They can test things. Uh, they can uh, you know shift the program. And we're working with an organization that's doing exactly that. They they research. They modify. They research. They modify. They really are trying to understand what works. And then once they've got that credibility and they've they've done the hard yards in terms of understanding that, they it it makes sense to then get others alongside uh, them to actually start learning from those practices. Not everyone should be going through the same learning process and paying the same school fees. If something really does does uh, ship up and work, then 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 it's important to try and try and do that. And there's a huge amount of credibility um, that 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 can be achieved through that. To do that, you need to do the research. You need to then start advocating. You need to build on first. You establish the basis of credibility, and then you start uh, leveraging that through uh, informing and influencing the ecosystem, whether that is other uh, players, uh, academics in the space, government in the space. Um, so the, the the knowledge sharing and the advocacy is absolutely critical to this process, in terms of uh, ach achieving extended impact. Um, and it takes time and effort, and it's 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 not obvious, you know, it's not your typical program, and you need the right, you know, the right capacity and the right level of of of, of individual to go out there and start championing that cause. 
Thank you, Nick. And Priya, you also mentioned how data and technology has played such a key role in, in some of the changes you've seen as well. And I think that also speaks quite well to, to what Nick was saying about the importance of, of knowledge sharing and, and really using those using that evidence to make decisions to, to scale up and, and to make a greater impact. And I know that there are a lot of questions still, and unfortunately the challenge that we always have with these sessions is that we do run out of time. Um, so we would like to continue the conversation further in other platforms, but for now, I just want to turn to the panelists for their brief closing thoughts. I know I know you still have a lot of short uh, thoughts to share, but if each of you could provide one or two key recommendations for companies to consider when taking their CSI strategies forward. And we'll start with Nick. Yeah, thanks. I, I think um, the recommendation would be to really start with the, the strategy and and your aspiration and understand what that looks like. Um, and, and then to ensure that you bring your executive team along with you. It's easier if it's aligned to the business and embedded within the executive structures of the business. Um, if it's peripheral to the business, it's much harder to get that kind of traction and that continuity and those own projects as Priya was talking about. So I think that's a, 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 a key strategy aligned to the organization and then bringing the, the decision-making team along with you um, to understand what that looks like. And if you are successful in actually convincing uh, your uh, executive structures that you are going to achieve or pursue this more extended impact, make sure you're capacitated to do that. You know, it's not the same team that was going out and visiting projects is not going to be the same team necessarily that's driving a more collaborative agenda. So you need to relook your organizational structures. Uh, but first and foremost, what are your aspirations? Can your strategy support those aspirations? Have you got the executive buy-in? Um, and then uh, and then have you got the team and the, the, the process to, to roll it out? Thank you so much, Nick. So, yeah, key for me there was step one, working out what are your aspirations and step two, working on how do you create the capacity to make those work. So thank you for sharing that, Nick. Uh, Norma, if I can ask you next, if you can provide one or two key recommendations for companies to consider when taking their CSI strategies forward. I think Taryn, being focused is key. Um, no, what myself is, where do you start and where do you end? Because what often tends to happen, we end up solving the, the issues that we don't have capacity for. So I think it's quite important to focus. I mean, as I said initially, we operate in a system that has a lot of complexity and dependencies. Um, your solution might not be holistic enough to the system's problems, and that is okay. So showcase that what you're doing makes sense and it works. So your research is quite key to showcase what that, what that looks like. And I think what I often find majority of the time, programs are not, uh, programs are good on paper, but in reality, they are different and they're always different. Um, and maybe my last one is that be okay to, to have the toughest conversations about what is not working about the program. I often find people think that funders want to hear what has worked and we shy away from noting what is not working about the programs. And, and because of those dependencies. And I mean, with every program, when we are solving any issue, there's always assumptions. Um, as much as we cooperate, we are coming into the system of education, if your key is education, there's already basic education that is helping. So I think um, showcasing, being, being comfortable in discussing what didn't work and what will help in improving those projects. And let's co-create together because we are all in this together. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much, Noma. Some great points there. And especially to bring in that point around making sure you know what your focus is, doing your research and really bringing in that element of transparency and sharing the challenges as well as what is working. So thank you. And Priya, we'll close with you. What are your one or two key recommendations for companies to consider when taking their CSI strategies forward? I think they have to be catalytic, right? Um, the resources and the networks and the strengths that the private sector has are unique. 
um, and how do we do four things, right? How do we really leverage their strengths to solve social causes that only they can? What Unilever did for hand washing or what banks are doing for financial inclusion, they've only been able to do it because they're leveraging their key strengths like Nick talked about, right? Second, that, and you know, to Noma's point, uh, we're all in it together. So think collaboration, right? Um, and so what is the little bit of investment that companies can make to get the largest number of actors to get behind a cause that they care about? Yes, it's hard, but it's totally worth it because the leverage that they see is very, very significant. Third, who are they influencing? So just on the point of knowledge, the question that I ask my corporates is, what's your exit strategy? And therefore, what data, what insights do you want to collect today that somebody else will use to really build a strategy to take over from you? And you have to build that in today and you have to get that stakeholder in today, right? So who are you trying to influence? Uh, and how do we get them into the room today so that companies can truly be catalytic? And the last, and we've learned this the hard way, is that we have to go from philanthropic funding to really creating sustainable markets for the poor. Um, CSI money is important to invest in the building blocks, the research, the experimentation, the innovation, the partnerships, some of the demonstration models. But ultimately, people have to go from receiving handouts to then being able to pay for it. It's not always true, right, when you think about gender-based violence or you know, injustice. Yes, there are some causes that always need grant funding, but a lot of other causes uh, can be moved towards a much more sustainable mechanism uh, if the funding is right and who better than the private sector to do this at scale, right? That's what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do we get them to build markets um, that are sustainable, cost-effective, efficient, effective, uh, for the poor by really leveraging both their CSI uh, resources as well as their networks. Thank you so much, Priya. Thank you for sharing that. And, and thank you for summarizing those points with us. Uh, we have unfortunately run out of time, but I want to ask all of you just to bear with me and stick with me for one more minute, just to share how we can return, um, how we can keep in touch and keep the conversation going. So firstly, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your insights for joining us today and, and for being so open with, um, with your recommendations and, and your lessons learned as well. So re to return to one last slide, just to share how you can keep, keep in touch with Trialog, how we can keep the conversation going. You can learn more about CSI trends, about many of the issues discussed today, many other responsible business topics and development topics on the Trialog Knowledge Hub. You can increase your nonprofit's visibility through inclusion in the NPO directory, which is also featured on the Trilog Knowledge Hub. And then do save the date and join us at the Trilog Business in Society conference on the 14th and 15th of May. And then, of course, do connect on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or X, or Instagram. Thank you so much, everyone, for the wonderful and informative discussion today. Have a wonderful day ahead and wishing you all the best for a successful 2024.